to the third series of the Great Books Mini Lectures. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank CoLab and uh, Video Production and Marketing for all the help they've given to uh, make this even possible. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, so thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us uh, over your lunch break uh, to hear uh, what's going to be a great presentation on Thoreau and Walden. I'm Michael Kerrigan, I'm assistant professor here uh, in the English department along with Professor Maureen Fitzpatrick. Uh, we're organizing this uh, this year's series. We have six wonderful presentations. We'll have three this semester and three in the spring. And if time permits, uh, please do come and uh, hear some wonderful talks on books that have mattered. To begin, uh, Mark Browning is a professor of English here at Johnson County. Uh, he began teaching part-time in 1988, and he moved to full-time responsibilities in 1992. Uh, he served the college and the department by teaching a number of classes, both in composition and literature, namely, uh, I believe, American literature and Bibleist literature. Uh, he has numerous academic publications. He's uh, presented at professional conferences for years. In fact, uh, just last year, I was uh, privileged to sit in on a presentation at the Four Seas where he presented on uh, the uh, applying the, archi excuse me, the genealogical standard Proof for standard. research, possibly yeah. in the composition and literature classrooms. Uh, it was interesting, very interesting. <laughs> uh, Mark's presentation today concerning Thoreau and Walden stems from uh, his own study and teaching. Uh, it's my understanding that in 2008, he participated in a national endowment Humanities workshop entitled Concord, Massachusetts, Transcendentalism and Social Action in Antebellum America. Uh, and his last sabbatical actually involved the writing of a play focused on the relationships uh, between Emerson and Hawthorne, uh, Fuller and Thoreau. Uh, we might even be able to say that he attempted his own sort of Thoreau-like experiment once. Uh, he, I think, moved out of the city a few years back uh, but, quote, didn't simplify enough and had to move back to the verbs. Uh, that happens. Uh, at the end of Professor Browning's remarks, we will have a chance for some questions and answers and discussion. Uh, so when those brilliant epiphanies and those pesky questions arise, uh, drop them and hold them. Nothing left to say except Professor Browning. Thank you. In March 1981, uh, the featured article in National Geographic was entitled, When the Space Shuttle Finally Flies. In that same, art in the same issue, there was a, uh, a, an article titled, make sure I get the title right, Following the Tracks of a Different Man, Thoreau. Uh, today, that last, actually final shuttle flight, not finally flying, but the final one is seven years back, and the surviving ships are spread around museums all over the country, but interest in Thoreau and in Walden remains probably as high as it's ever been. Uh, in fact, last year the same publication, National Geographic, did an article on the, uh, the 200th anniversary of Thoreau's birth. And so the question is maybe why? I'm curious if this is going to work. Oh, it does. Good. Um, so let's, let's take a little bit of a look at you know, who this guy is, what this book is, and hopefully some insights that maybe you hadn't thought of as to you know, what it means and perhaps why it's been uh, as enduring as it has been. Uh, we should start with the man's name. Henry David Thoreau was born David Henry Thoreau, and he decided to switch his first two names. But then there's the pronunciation of his last name. If you go to the academic conferences and the real heavy-duty advocates of this author, they will tell you it is thorough. And in fact, there are people from his time who make it clear that that was the way he pronounced his name, and that is probably the, the more proper pronunciation of his name. But everybody who's not a thorough snob, take that either way you want to, um, it, we, everybody else says thorough. So I'm going to stick with that for today, even though I know I'm wrong. Um, but Thoreau was born in 1817 in Concord, Massachusetts. And Concord, if you're not familiar with it, was, is a very old town. It was the first English settlement in Massachusetts above tidewater, meaning you couldn't sail a ship to it. Uh, it is also the cradle of the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, they, they took great 
great pride in the shot heard around the world that happened there. Uh, and he then went a few miles east at the appropriate time to go to Harvard University, Harvard College at the time. And there is a story that says Thoreau didn't graduate from Harvard because he refused to pay $5 to get a diploma. It's a great story. It sounds like him, but it really didn't happen quite like that. It was a, it was a sort of a different thing. He did graduate from Harvard, uh, and they claim him. After that, he did, had a number of jobs, but mostly stayed around Concord. And eventually, the thing we want to focus on, he lived in a lake house from 1845 to 47. Of course, that lake house was the little, the little uh, shed, I guess you'd say, at Walden Pond. Let's look at Walden Pond, shall we? That's an aerial view of Walden Pond. We've got the Fitchburg Railroad going right along here. It goes right next to the, to the pond. Um, and this little inlet here points straight at Concord and basically points straight north. Henry's cabin would have been about here. His bean field would have been about here, somewhere in there. I don't know how big it was. Uh, but I find that kind of interesting in a way because if you look at where I just put my hand, it doesn't look terribly agricultural, does it? And I think it's an important thing to remember is that Walden, as beautiful as it is, and it is a beautiful place, uh, it doesn't look today like it did in his time. It's much more forested than it was. Concord itself, gorgeous town with huge old trees, much more forested than it was in his time. Um, but... Um, but that's Walden. And when we think of Walden, we typically think of, you know, beautiful places. It's perpetually calm, and it has the woods all around. And it's true. I mean, that's an actual photograph of Walden. And, or if you're really kind of mystically inclined, it might look more like that. And that's a good picture. But it also, at times, looks like that. <laughs> and really, the, the, and let's see, Jim, is that where you went swimming? No. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't suggesting you were in the picture or anything, but, uh, but um, you know, Walden Pond today is a recreational destination just like it was in Thoreau's time. People go fishing, people, uh, people go boating, people go there for a walk. Uh, at, in Thoreau's time, they used it for all of those things, and they had, he had his big watermelon feed every year at Walden because, well, it was just a nice place to go. It was just close enough to town, a mile and a half. Um, during the two years or so, that, a little over two years, that Henry was at the pond, we can connect virtually all of his important works. Uh, of course, the, the main book, Walden, is based on his experience there. Uh, he wrote the bulk of his uh, first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, while he was living in the cabin there. Uh, he, let's see, what else? I've got a list. Um, oh, Civil Disobedience, his most famous essay, came during this time. He went into town, was confronted by the tax collector, thrown in jail when he refused to pay six years of back taxes, and ends up writing a, an essay that in, influenced a lot of different people, including Mahatma Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, his trip to the Maine woods that resulted in the very cleverly titled book Maine Woods. Uh, that came during these years. And of course he worked on his journals all during this time. So virtually all of his important works are somehow connected to those two years that he was there. Tired of looking at people in bathing suits. So we'll go back. He died in 1862 in Concord, Massachusetts. All right, enough of that. Let's look at the book. Walden, or Life in the Woods, was published, if you read your Roman numerals well, in 1854. It was published by Tickner and Fields, which was a big-time publisher at that time, big-time literary publisher in Boston. Uh, and unlike his first book, which is mentioned up there, A Week on the Concord Merrimack Rivers, it was commercially published. It was somewhat successful. The, the previous book, he had published at his own expense and did an edition of 1,000 copies, and he sold 300 of them which means two things. You lose money, and you're stuck with 700 books of your, you know, that you already read. Uh, so you know, it, it doesn't have the, it, it was a little more successful. This was not a bestseller, but it was a successful book and was well-reviewed. 
Um, it was published, as I said, 1854, seven years after he left the farm and about ten years after he, per, or, sorry, nine years after he first got there. Uh, what's the genre of this book? It doesn't really fit genres. It's certainly not a novel. Um, is it, is it uh, a piece of natural history? Well, Thoreau did natural history. In fact, his first really successful uh, publication was the Natural History of Massachusetts, which, I mean, we all just want to run out and read, right? But apparently it was very successful. And he had magazine publishers who were saying, give us more of that, give us more of that. That's what we want. We don't really want your transcendentalist essays. They're fine, but give us, uh, give us something about bees or about birds or something of that nature. Um, so it wasn't that. It wasn't philosophy exactly. It certainly wasn't a journal. He kept journals all, his, all through his adult life, but that's not what it was. Um, is it a memoir? Well, maybe. Uh, but really, he probably ends up talking more about the, the place he is and the people around him than, than himself. So it's not exactly like we typically think of, of memoirs. E.B. White said, Walden is the report of a man torn by two powerful and opposing drives, the desire to enjoy the world and not be derailed by a mosquito wing, it's a, uh, and, and the urge to set the world straight. So to enjoy the world or set the world straight. One cannot join these two successfully, but sometimes, in rare cases, something good or even great results from the attempt of the tormented spirit to reconcile them. So that's what E.B. White thought that Walden was. I, I don't have a great answer for it. I think it's its own thing, uh, which I guess is a great answer. Uh, the structure of it, there are 18 chapters. They were originally envisioned as 18 essays, and then he worked them into some semblance of a whole, and I think a successful semblance of a whole. Theoretically, it compresses the 26 months that he spent at the, at the pond into 12 months. Early on, he says, basically, I was there for two years, but I'm just going to cover a year. And we say that, but really that year-long structure kind of gets forgotten at times in the course of the book. The last few chapters, um, but, well, the first few, he's talking about how he got started, how he built his house, things of that nature, but he really doesn't take us through fall and, uh, and, and actually the end of the first summer and things like that quite the way we might expect him to. Um, it, it's as if he forgot what he was doing, and then in the last six chapters he says, oh, by the way, there's a calendar, and starts, starts going through things, and they deal with late fall and winter, and, and then we get to spring, and it's like he hits the fast-forward button, and at the end of the of spring, actually spring deals much more with, uh, with the breaking up of the ice, which to me, that's winter, or the end of winter, than the things we would typically think. I mean, spring, that's a great poetic season, right? He doesn't do much with spring. There aren't any flowers blossoming or, or new shoots coming up or anything. It's, we got, the, got rid of the ice, and well, that's about it. And at the end of spring, he says, Thus was my first year's life in the woods completed. And the second year was similar to it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so I don't think he's trying to really show us this is exactly what a year uh, living in the woods is like. Uh, now the first and the longest of those 18 chapters is economy. How many of you have ever started reading Walden and economy just about did you in? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Former student of mine there. Uh, what, but it wasn't for my class, right? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, the single, that single chapter represents about a fourth of the text. And it is what stops, I think, a lot of Thoreau's readers. It does have some great stuff, uh, including the famous line that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. But it also goes into a lot of detail about how he built his house and down to the last half penny how much it cost. Uh, so... It's, it's a lot to get through. But I think it, it's actually a telling thing for us uh, that he starts off with that idea of economy. Because for Thoreau, economy was the, 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 in the original, the Greek um, origin of the word, oikos, or home, and nomos, law, 
it, it was about, you know, how do you live? How, how, do, you, how do you do home economics is, is, is kind of a, a redundancy because home is already built into it. And for, for Thoreau, all of what he's writing here is about how are we going to live? Uh, the second chapter takes us to uh, the, the one that kind of fires people's imaginations. If, if there is one that really gets people going, it is where I lived and what I lived for. And I spent recently about an hour searching through the movie Dead Poets Society, looking for the place where Robin Williams shares this great line, and I realized it wasn't in there. It was the kids that did it. And so it's 22 seconds. Oops. No, 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 don't do that. Okay, that's worth going through, and they skipped a little bit. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. I mean, if that doesn't get the blood pumping, I don't know what will. Um, that's where he lived and what he lived for. Well, let's look at where he lived. That is not Thoreau's cabin. That's a recreation of Thoreau's cabin. And <laughs> If you go to Concord and you go to Walden Pond, you can see this, and it is as a good American tourist site would be right next to the parking lot. It's not in the original site. We're going we're gonna to see the original site here in, in a couple of minutes. But as you can see, where he lived wasn't much. Uh, I was, I've been thinking uh, uh, lately about, about tiny houses. You know, you've probably seen some of the, the reality shows about tiny houses, and they're really cool. And they're a lot cooler than that. I mean, this was a pretty Spartan sort of a place. He used that Spartan-like. I wonder if he was completely cognizant of that when he said that about Spartan-like that the Spartans had slaves. I don't know. But, uh, you know, Thoreau was all about, in this chapter, I mean, throughout the book, but especially in this chapter, he had the famous line, simplify, simplify, right? He was all about simplifying. Um, and that's a pretty good move toward simplification. Near my house, there's this house. These people, well, you know, they've got, they got a little, there's a flag there, and there's an American flag over here, and there's a flag, and they got birdhouses all over the place. They got all sorts of stuff. It's, it's very tidy. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's well kept, and it's tidy, but I drive past this place just about every day, and I, I wanted to, and I, I apologize for my bad photography, but I felt really weird taking pictures as I was looking at these people's house, and I kind of, I just noticed in looking at it, there may be somebody there looking at me and saying, what are you doing? Uh, but here, between the yellow bird house and the yellow bird feeder and the white eagle or whatever that is, you can't really read it, but trust me, it says, simplify. <laughs> I, yeah. And that's, that kind of gets me to, yeah, well, something I want to come back to in a minute. Um, oops. Oh, yeah, that was the, yeah. Okay, there's the inside of his cabin. Um, it, was, it was simplified. And, you know, one other thing that strikes me about Thoreau in building it, as he describes it, is he was very much built for the needs of the moment. He put the roof on it because it was going to rain some during the summer. And he chinked the, the walls and built the chimney because it was going to get cold. And he didn't bother getting it all done at the same time before he moved in. Um, now, I mentioned earlier spring, the ch chapter on spring seems more interested in the end of winter, 
and uh, following the ice then on the usual poetic emphases of spring. Um, besides, oh, I could go through all the chapters, I'm not going to, uh, you can thank me later, uh, but Walden also, we might miss this, seems to employ and then parody some of the popular genres of the day. For example, economy deals, as we said before, in great detail with building a house. Well, there was a great popularity, sort of the HDTV of its time, of home books in, in Thoreau's day. It was building a great house, and the house making the person was a big thing, sort of like it is today. I mean, think about it, those tiny house, the, 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 the tiny house movement is a statement. People saying they kind of, they want to define who they are by their house, just like those who build McMansions want to say who they are by their house. Uh, well, Perot, no, that would have been the guy that ran for president. Thoreau was, he was doing the, uh, the same sort of thing. He was taking that and then sort of turning it on its head and saying, yeah, yeah, you spent that much on a house? Let me show you what I did on a house. Uh, at the same time, in the bean field, he takes the, the considerable literature, I was completely unaware of this until recently, the considerable literature about uh, how to do agriculture and, and how not to be wasteful. That sounds great, you know, to, to use the land well and to, to fertilize and all those sort of things you're, you're supposed to do to be a wise farmer. The problem with some of that uh, advice, though, is it tends to be very elitist. It, it's only something that's available to the, uh, to the wealthy. And it was basically a move toward moving the, uh, the sort of a, a plantation model to the north with, instead of, of African slaves, very poorly paid Irish immigrants. And I mean, that's something that was very much the case at that time. You know, how do you, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough land, well, then you shouldn't be the farmer. Um, the bean field, he basically said, I'm not gonna fertilize and I'm gonna grow something that really doesn't make any sense to grow. Beans were not a cash crop. Um, and it's something that we read and we think, wow, you were really not a very good gardener, right, Andrew? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, that's not what he was, he was going for there. Um, brute neighbors, I, this one kind of hit me because of my, my uh, background in study in fly fishing literature. Brute neighbors is a dialogue between a poet, William Ellery Channing, and a hermit, Thoreau himself, and they are talking as they're enjoying a fishing trip <clears throat> but the nature of the dialogue and the fact that it's a dialogue is very reminiscent, not of a contemporary genre, but of Isaac Walton's uh, The Complete Angler. And yet it takes some of the, the things talked about there and turns those on their head. So, so there is a lot going on in, in Walden that if we don't understand the literature surrounding it, we really don't get it. Um, now, what it doesn't do, and I find this kind of surprising, is it doesn't very often indulge in sort of nature writing as a pretense for moral or philosophical or ethical or religious teaching. I mean, he might agree with the psalmist that the heavens declare the glory of God, but he doesn't deign to put those kind of declarations into his own words. He, he lets religious information, religious thoughts, mostly taken from Hindu texts, uh, speak for themselves. He lets nature speak for itself. He doesn't try to merge the two. Occasionally he does, but that's something that, that many nature writers will tend to do. <clears throat> so, who is Henry and what is Walden? Great question. Lots of people want to claim him. Uh, Republicans can claim him. Contemporary Republicans can claim him because of his rugged individualism and, and belief in in uh, sort of self-reliance, um, especially trying to transcend regulation as imposed by the government. Libertarians can claim him uh, because he wanted to do things his own way with as little in interference as possible and wanting to get beyond the regulations of society. Democrats can claim him as an adherent to many of today's progressive causes. Uh, although the Democrats of his own age would have hated him because he was an abolitionist and was opposed to territorial expansion, which was in its high water at that, at that point. Uh, if there were still Whigs about, they'd probably want to claim him, but he would take exception with them. Environmentalists 
can claim him as a man who attempted to leave a relatively light footprint on the earth and paid a great deal of attention and ascribed great value to the natural world. Yet this is a guy who cut down a lot of trees and started one of the worst forest fires the region had ever seen. It never seemed to outlive that. And it was like, oh yeah, you're the guy that started the fire. Um, revolutionaries or reformers can claim him as a figure who inspired Gandhi and, and through him, Martin Luther King Jr. And he was working at a time when many of the sort of right-thinking people were nominally in favor of ab abolition, but weren't really eager to hazard anything to end the practice of slavery. Thoreau was probably about as uncompromising an abolitionist and an advocate of racial equality as you could find during that period. Um, agrarian homesteaders can claim him as a man who abandoned the seductive charms of city life and embraced, em embraced a simple life hoeing peas, but he didn't do it very well. There are people who like to sneer at him. Uh, they'll say he's a hypocrite because he didn't stay out there by himself all the time. He never said he was going to. I don't understand that. Or because he went into town several times a week. Well, okay. <laughs> that, that, that seems misguided. Perhaps more, more significantly, they'll call him a misogynist. Uh, one reason for that it was he took his laundry in to his mother and his sister. You know, well, that's not entirely fair either. I mean, Thoreau had a great deal of respect for, for, for his mother, from whom he got many of his ideas, and his mother was a formidable woman, far more of a, of a, a force in his life, I think, than his father. Uh, but he also probably had some of his best writing instruction from Margaret Fuller when she was the editor of The Dial. And, and you know, well, that's, there's about as good of, of uh, uh, Fuller's got about as good of credentials as a feminist at that time as you could, as you could find. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's entirely fair. They'll say he's antisocial because he had a whole chapter that was talking about solitude that was followed by a chapter titled Visitors. You know, he, nah, that doesn't really fit. They say he's lazy. Well, you could make an argument for that, but he really was a pretty energetic guy. He just didn't work the way people wanted him to work. Uh, and he definitely didn't want to spend a lot of his, he didn't want to get a job and work every day. That wasn't, that wasn't Thoreau. Uh, they'll say he's anti-government. And, well, yes, he was. Uh, but he's not an anarchist. I mean, this is the man that says in civil disobedience that that government is best which governs least. Uh, but he also spent a lot of his time surveying and, and doing things that were very uh, sort of in the, the, the civil uh, structure of things. Uh, he probably would have believed the old Madison quotation, if men were angels, there would, we would need no government. There are, he said, there are so many keen and subtle masters that enslave both North and South, it is hard to have a Southern overseer. It is worse to have a Northern one. But worst of all is when you are the slave driver of yourself. Talk of a divinity in man. Um, I think Really, if, if uh, we say Thoreau was anti-government, he really wasn't anti-government, he, but he wanted the government to start with us. He wanted us to govern ourselves and thought that would solve a lot of the problems. So, bottom line, Henry cannot serve as a model for any particular political stripe. Uh, he's a problematic environmental figure, as many strengths as he had. His mode of life doesn't turn out to be particularly sustainable. Uh, and, but when we read his words with an open mind, we find ourselves thinking about ourselves. So, if you come, I think I'm supposed to go to the next one here. Nope, I'm not. Never mind, you didn't see that. Uh, if you come to Henry David Thoreau looking for a practical model of how to live, if you think that moving to the side of a pond and building yourself a tiny house and preparing to raise beans and watch ants fight is the answer, then you're sure to be disappointed. If Thoreau had believed that that model of life was the model of life, then we have to ask ourselves, well, why did he leave? Uh, or why didn't he go somewhere else? He apparently left because Emerson said, eh, you need to get out of there, you're cutting down too many trees. But he could have found somewhere else to go. Why didn't he do it? I think he'd, he felt like it had run its course. Um, in writing about it seven years later, he didn't look back 
all that wistfully at it and saying, I wish I could go back. Uh, and he didn't look back on it and say that was a big mistake. It was an experiment, and it was an experiment that was finished. It was not an experiment aimed at answering questions about the sort of house to build or how many acres to cultivate or what sort of food to eat. It was an experiment in looking at life in a very deliberate manner. Like Plato, Henry would say the unexamined life is not worth living. But I think that with this book, I hear an author who's... who's uh, not just repeating that, that truth, but say, no, no, really, listen to me. It is worth, it's not worth living. Let's do some examination. He urges us to strip away the things that we think are so important, the things that others tell us are so important, especially the freshet of shams and appearances that I had in my title at the very beginning that fill the world, and then to focus ourselves on what remains, to find profundity in the depth of the water or the breaking up of ice. In the end, when we follow Thoreau's advice, when we simplify, freeing ourselves from the pointless burdens that society and our own vanities would happily pile onto us, we're left with ourselves and that part of the world we inhabit. And I'll let him close us. However mean your life is, meet it and live it. Do not shun it and call it hard names. It is not so bad as you are. It looks poorest when you are richest. The fault finder will find faults even in paradise. Love your life, poor as it is. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? I was either that baffling or that good. Right. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have read a lot about Louisa May Alcott, uh -huh. and I understand. I have heard that. I don't. There's no. Re I haven't. Walden is the only thing. Uh huh. I, no, I have heard that, but it's been quite a while back that I heard it, and I don't. It's not fresh in my mind. But I, when you said that, I was like, yes, I do remember that. You know, the the, the Alcotts lived in, I mean, just right on the outskirts of Concord, and they ran in the same circles. Bronson Alcott was one, another of the leading transcendentalists. So. Uh, you know, certainly they would have known each other. And, you know, Michael kindly left out a word that I put in when I when he, they, they asked about, the, didn't you do a sabbatical about that? And I said, I wrote a bad play. And, uh, yeah. Maybe you could make it into a rap There you go. <laughs> the low. The sequel to Hamilton. Okay, Andrea. Uh, well, what, what is Walden's I, I think, I mean, as far as, I think it's about, about as good as it's been. I mean, it, it's, it, I think it comes and goes, basically, the more, uh, the more the counterculture is sort of feeling the need to say more, and that's, that doesn't apply to our current age, does it? Uh, it attains more, more currency, and so uh, probably more, uh, if you take compared to say the 1960s, it's probably more on the environmental front or uh, race relations, and as opposed to the the, the anti-war. Uh, I mean, I'm just I, I'm going off the top of my head on that, but I, I think it has I think it has remained very popular throughout the ages because, you know, not because like I said before, it, because it's got a great thing on how to raise beans or building a little house, but because it talks to people about, look at life and really look at it and strip away all the junk. And I mean, that's, he asks questions and he doesn't, I don't think he always likes the answers he comes up with, uh, but, but he does ask the questions. And I think that's important to him. So I mean, I, that to me is a timeless sort of a thing. Yeah. Uh, I might be able to comment on that. Um, there's actually a book in our library by Richard Karnak, and I'm trying to think if it's Walden Revisited or, I don't know, I know the author's name. And he and a team of uh, researchers actually went and took all of the notations that, um, that Thoreau made about when the ice broke, when the first buds came out, and he did a comparison, you know, 150 years later to see, oh. you know, what environmental changes right. he could identify. And 
I think it's about a three week difference um, mm-hmm. that he, that from that that he's Yeah, that, I, that's. Reported. So, I mean. So in that case, it's a very. Scientific. Uh, a very scientific yeah. and, thing. And yeah. you know, we all know that one, being members of the Midwest, we know that one year is entirely different from another year. So I don't know how you could nail it down to scientifically accurate, but um, it, it is an observation that, and, and it's- Well, well I think it's, it speaks to the fact that, that even though he was, he was and I'm, I'm gonna say this, I don't wanna be, sound disparaging, was trying to play philosopher, he was, he had real credentials as a, an amateur natural scientist. You know, he was not, he didn't have a degree in biology, but he, he was very attentive and you know, he, he knew his stuff. And he, he was a good scientist in the, case, in the way of keeping records. Jim. Yeah, I, I got to read uh, The Maine Woods, another one of his lesser known books this last summer in Maine. And I, I was struck by two things. First of all, what you just said, he's such a meticulous natural scientist. For somebody without a biology degree, he could write more about moss than anybody yeah. can imagine. But he also talks about his Indian guide on his various trips through the Maine woods. And he uses this kind of Rousseauian, noble, savage um, kind of language that kind of borders up against racism. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, have you encountered that in his other work? Or how does that fit with this? I've not. I, I, I think for a guy living in New England, his attitudes, toward, again, towards slavery, I mean, like, he was right there with, with John Brown. And, and even defended John Brown when everyone was saying, "You're crazy! Don't don't do that." And uh, and you know, and John Brown was notable for not just for being, well, not just being violent, but also not being just being an abolitionist, but truly believing in in equality. Um, and I think I think Thoreau, I, mean, I see things that suggest he had that same feeling. He would not have had a problem with sharing his cabin with with a black man. That, just wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, the uh, I don't know on the Native American thing. I don't. I can't think of anything. Uh, yeah, it seemed like all the transcendentalists had a sort of romantic approach yeah. to Native people, right? And, and sometimes that collided with what they encountered in them as human beings. Well, you know, and, and to some degree, I, I I hate to impose today's standards, and, and I'm sure you do too, on on. 150 years ago, uh, while still looking at things as they really are, uh, you know, just like the, you know, he cut down trees. Well, okay, he cut down trees. That's what they burned in their fireplaces. I mean, that's that's an unfair criticism to make of his environmental credentials. And I think, you know, but I think what you're suggesting there is that I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with that. I haven't read Maine Woods in a long time. Yes. I, I don't know. I just it's it's one that because I have I have real mixed feelings about Thoreau. I I like a lot of what he says and I find him annoying at times, um, which apparently a lot of people that knew him found him annoying. But uh, I just I find he just keeps making me think, and I think that's a that's a worthwhile thing. Uh, plus, I thought it was one that would appeal to a few folks, so better than the Scarlet Letter or something. <laughs> To, the, to your point about mixed feelings, one of the things that I really like about uh, Walden uh, and dislike is his take on consumerism. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, he, he does a really nice job talking about how things can trap you mm-hmm. and how uh, people try to um, be free and live good lives while accumulating all these things and those things keep you from being free. And I think that that's something that's very useful society. At the same time, he takes that consumerism so far uh, in the sense that anything that a family might need uh, to him becomes imprisonment. He yeah. seems to be very much against uh, family and, 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 and I think it's marriage to a certain extent, yeah. even though he doesn't come right out and say it. And I wonder if that's a tension for you that, that you can talk Well, that about was about. one thing I, I thought, of all the things he wants to to sort of shed and not be encumbered by, he doesn't deal, I mean, he, he has his own family, he, which he doesn't hardly mention in the book, but he was pretty devoted to them, his mother, his sister, his, his father, until he died. Uh, and 
but he does not have a spouse. He does not have children. And I think that it's, it's hard not to be, I mean, not to be encumbered to some degree when you have children. Uh, and it's, it, and it's, sometimes it's hard to, be, to not be encumbered when you have parents. I say this, and my wife's sitting here, and, and my, one of my questions was, oh, who'd you leave mom with? Because <laughs> my mother's living with us right now, and we don't leave her by herself for more than about an hour. You know, it, it, that's hard to do. Well, he had that luxury at that point in his life. I, I wonder if he'd have lived to be 60 and his mother was, was quite aged, he would have felt the same way. I, and I, I think a, a lot of times one of the things that annoys me about Thoreau is he is so forceful and strident, and he's such a good writer that you just find yourself wanting to disagree with him and wanting to, you know, to say, well, but wait a minute, that doesn't fit in this category. And he's not a, he's not a, a formal philosopher. He's, he's wanting us to think, and I think he would probably, if we got into a big conversation, would probably back off on some of the things and say, yeah, well, that, okay, it doesn't work in that situation, but in general, it's true. It's a long answer to a short question. I'm not even sure it was an answer. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. If you haven't read any of his books, which one would you start with? I would start with Walden. Um, and probably, I mean, if you want to get, like I said, the blood pump and skip to chapter two, then go back and catch economy. Um, oh, okay, yeah. It, I mean, it's good. It's just, it, it seems a little more scattered. And I think that there, it might be, he, he is too good a writer to, to bungle things. And I think, I think, perhaps what he was trying to do there was sort of give a sense of he's a little scattered and then as that year goes on he starts to focus in more and you know the idea that he he does his checking of the depth of Walden Pond late in the book well you know that's there's a metaphor there he doesn't state it but there's a metaphor he's figuring out how you know the depth of things and the breaking up of the ice that can be a metaphor too again he doesn't say and that means but I think it's there and, and, and that's, I, 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 when I read some of these passages, I just think, you, he makes it look so easy. Because he was a very fine literary stylist in a way that I think that, that like, uh, let's see, Bill Stockton's not here, I can say this. Uh, in a way that like Emerson, I don't feel like is. I mean, Emerson's good. I, I think Thoreau, at his best, is as just a, just a writer, is far better. It just, it just looks so easy, uh, but that's, that, that would be where I would start. Um, the week on the Concord Merrimack River is the other one I know reasonably well because I used it in my dissertation. It's not as good because he was still learning this craft at that point. Anybody else? One more. Going, going. I get to go to class. My class, my 12 o'clock class assured me they would show up at one o'clock, so. Uh, all right, well, thank you.